So glad to have you with us today. Let me say, men's conference called Stronger is coming up the first Saturday in June. And I want to encourage you, put it on your calendar. It starts at 9. It's going to be done around noon or so. We're going to have some food. It's going to be an incredible event. Pastor Brandon Beals is speaking. We've got some competition for the men. Let me know that, men, we need to get stronger. Not physically, necessarily, but we need to get spiritually strong. And so I want to invite you to come and join us. It's going to be incredible. So talk to somebody. Go online. Register. Be a part. It's going to be an incredible time. Well, we're starting a brand new series this week called Building Blocks of the Faith. So I'd like to do this. Would you stand to your feet, everybody? We're going to honor the reading of God's Word, and we're going to read this passage found in the book of Ephesians. And I want you to read it now with me. Santa Paula, I know you're standing. I want you to read. I want to hear you all the way from Valencia. Wherever you are joining us, let's read this together out loud. Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 19. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. I want to pause there. You see, if you're not Jewish, then that means you're a Gentile. So if you are Jewish or you're not, that's everybody. That you and I are members of God's family. Isn't that good news? Now let's look and continue on. Ready? Together, we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We gotta have a sure foundation. We gotta build the right way. And we're gonna learn some principles for that this weekend. As we pray over this um, sermon today, can we also take a moment to pray for those who there was a shooting in um, New York, and I just wanna pray that God will bring comfort to those families today, can we pray? Father, we thank you that you are, as we, we know the passage says, an ever-present help in time of need. So I, I pray, God, be present. Be present for those that are hurting today, have lost someone they love. And I pray that you'd step in, and in the middle of it, somehow you would even be seen. Lord, that you'd speak to hearts. I also pray today you'd prepare us, Lord, to hear and receive what you want to say. Lord, no matter where we are around the world, whether we're in Santa Paula or right here, in the Valencia location, we are thankful for your presence. So we pray this. Everybody do this. Put your hand on your heart. Say this, Holy Spirit, speak to me in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated today. Thank you. We need a strong foundation. And we got to build the right way. I was thinking about building. If we're going to build, have building blocks and build high or strong or tall, I, I, I ran across this diagram. I want to show you. It's a picture of a skyscraper, kind of the design of it. And you can see that it goes very high into the air. But what's interesting about a skyscraper, which you might not know, is that it goes high in the air because it goes low into the ground. And as you see this diagram, it actually shows these pillars that go past what you see, the old bay clay. So there's this clay. It has to get beneath the clay to the bedrock. It has to get to where there's a strong, solid core foundation. And if we're going to build strong in our faith, we need to have some building blocks, some center stones, some foundational things in our lives. And so what I want to do over the next several weeks is I want to highlight some of the foundational building blocks of our faith. We have a lot of people that have gotten saved in our church over the last year. We have a lot of people that have come new and they're from maybe different religious backgrounds. So we want to make sure that we have the right foundation. So here's some cool things. We're going to talk in the next few weeks. One of them is about Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus, the Christ. We're going to talk about that, that he's the way, truth, and the life. We're going to spend a week, and we're going to talk about Scripture. Why do we love the Bible? Why do we follow the Bible? Because it is the Word of God. It, it, it doesn't have error. It is the perfect Word of God. So we're going to talk about inerrancy of Scripture, the power of Scripture. We're going to take a week and talk about the fact that Jesus didn't just come once, but the Bible says He's coming again. That Jesus is going to return to take His bride, the church, back home. So we're going to talk about that. This week, though, I really felt, because it just so happened that this is baptismal week, I decided as I was praying, in fact, if you go to the book of Hebrews, you'll discover in chapter 6, 
that baptism, water baptism, is one of the foundational principles of our faith. So today we're going to spend some time talking about water baptism. All right? And this is important, and let me tell you why it's important. Because Jesus, before he went to heaven and ascended, one of the last things he did was he gave the Great Commission. In other words, his last words, the last things he, that he said before he left this world. Now, let me know that that's pretty important stuff. So now watch what he says. If, you're, if you have a Bible, turn with me. If you're in Santa Paula or somewhere joining us around the country, go to Matthew chapter 28. I want you to see what Jesus said, his last words. He said this, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. In other words, tell everybody about me, preach the gospel, and make disciples. And then he says, and here's the other component. What's the next word? That was kind of weak. Let's try it again. I want to hear you in every location. The next word is what? Baptizing. Baptizing. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And one translation says this way, And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. We used to joke and say that that's a promise for people that are vertically challenged, that God will always be with them. Lo, I am with you. Even. Just making sure you're awake this morning. Jesus says this. He says, hey, I want you to preach the gospel and get people baptized. And so if this was that important to Jesus, then I think we need to take it seriously, and we need to spend a little time talking about it. And so today, I want to kind of address, now let me just say, how many know that if you've been around in church for a while, how many know that if you grew, how many grew up in church? Do we have some people that grew up in church? How many know when you grow up in church, you see some crazy stuff sometimes? Let me just say it this way. How many of you grew up in a Pentecostal church? How many know you saw some wild stuff growing up, right? Anybody have sister shout about in your church too? Right? And um, so, you know, things would happen, and you know what's crazy is when you do baptisms, sometimes crazy things happen. I'm telling you, I have seen over the years crazy things happen in baptismal services when people get baptized. I've seen baptisms out in rivers. I've seen them in dunk tanks. I've seen them in like a tank like we have. Um, and so I'm going to tell you just kind of a, a funny baptismal story. Is that okay? Okay, so several years ago, a family that, um, was, that came to the church, got saved, they came to me, and they, they were friends of ours, and they said, hey, you know, Pastor Jared, we would really like to do a baptism. We have family coming in. We can't do it on the weekend, and we'd love to do it. Our dream has always been to be baptized in the ocean. Would you come and baptize us in the ocean? And I'm like, okay. So we looked at calendars and got it all together and said, I'm in. And they said, we've got family coming in. This is a special thing. So this is now the middle of the winter. So, um, so we decide, I go, and I'm driving over to the coast, and I have in my car, my wetsuit, ready to go, and uh, don't, don't uh, call me a cha-cha or anything like that, but I don't like cold, and so I had my sweatsuit, and that sweatsuit, my uh, wetsuit, and they had a wetsuit too, so it wasn't just me. So we get over to the coast, they're already there, family's there, um, all these people that have driven in from wherever they are, they're all over there um, on the beach, and I'm parked, and there's not much around, there's no bathrooms, there's nothing, so I have to change and get in my wetsuit um, in the car. How many have ever tried to put a wetsuit on in the car? That's a, I felt a little bit like Houdini who's trying to get out of a, anyway. So I'm putting on the wetsuit and, you know, I'm pulling it up and I kind of get it and I get it kind of almost, how many have ever put on a wetsuit and it's like for some reason it's like impossible to get the wetsuit all the way to your waist. It like starts a little bit, bar, you know, down. So I'm trying, trying to get it, I'm all squeezed in and I'm sweating now because I'm in the car and that makes, how many have ever tried to, when you're sweating, put on a wetsuit, it's even worse. <laughs> So I'm like profusely sweating, the, the, the wetsuit, I'm irritated because I'm late, I got to get out there to baptize them. So I'm like, I got to get this thing up. I reach around to pull it into place, and suddenly as I pull, I hear, <laughs> and I turn around and I look, and there is a watermelon hole in the back side of my wetsuit. I have a naked bottom. And I'm like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Because here's the thing, I did not bring a swimsuit. So I don't know what I'm going to do. 
So I finish, I put the, switch, the, the wetsuit on, I wrap a towel around my waist, and I walk confidently out to the, <laughs> to the beach. I get out to the beach. See, some of you never know what really goes on behind closed doors for pastors. So I get out to the beach, and everybody says hello, and we all hug and everything, and I make sure that the, the towel is really tight. I walk up to the family, I pull them aside, and said, hey, we've had a little bit of a complication. And um, uh, today, we're going to have to do things differently. So here's how it's going to work. And I told them, I, I had a mistake. I, I ended up pulling my wetsuit, and now I have no bottom. So I don't want to flash everybody, um, you know, the moon. And so I said... Here's what we're going to do. When, when it's time to do this thing, I'm going to turn with my back to the water, with my feet in the water, and you guys will all be on the beach. I'm going to hand you my towel. Let's just not say anything. We don't need to give, you know, we don't need to bring anything up. And then I'm just going to kind of like, let's go in, and I'm going to back into the water. I'm, I guess, is, this, is this okay with you? And they're like, okay, let's, let's do it this way. So, so I start, you know, moonwalking back into the water. <laughs> And I get into the water where the waves are up above kind of my waist. And they come in. I baptize them. And everything is awesome. It's a really cool, special moment for their family. And then when it's over, they go out. And I kind of go forward. They hand me the towel. I wrap it around. It's over. And no one even knows. But here's the crazy part of the story. This doesn't often happen. But they decided to give me a gift. And guess what the gift was? They bought me a wetsuit. Come on now. <laughs> Jehovah Jireh, our God provides. Amen. He knows what you need before you even know you need it. Amen. I'm telling you, funny stuff has happened over the years in baptismal services. Literally, I've seen crazy things. So what I've decided to do, since baptism is so important that Jesus brought it up, that this is a strategic component of the journey, then I want to ask a few questions. And then I'm going to answer those questions biblically. Is that all right? If you're, if you're with me on that, Santa Paula, wherever you are, just shout amen or wave your hand at me, all right? Amen. So here we go. Question number one. Question number one is this. Do I have to get baptized? Every time I say that word, I think I want to be like Nacho Libre and say, have you been baptized? Come on, anybody? <laughs> Sorry. Do I have to be baptized to go to heaven? Do I have to be baptized to go to heaven? A simple question, but maybe in your religious tradition or maybe you've, you're new to your faith and you don't know the answer to that question. Here's the answer to the question. You do not have to be water baptized to get to heaven. And I'll give you an example in Scripture because we look at Scripture as the foundation for what we do, right? Remember the story when Jesus is on the cross and a man is next to him on the cross, a, a murderer, an evil thief. But what happens, the Bible says he puts his faith in Jesus and he looks at Jesus and said, hey, we're guilty, but you're not. So what is he doing? He's confessing his sin. And he says, Jesus, I'm putting my trust in you. Will you remember me when you enter into your kingdom? And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. That man found forgiveness through Christ and went to heaven. How many know he couldn't be baptized? He was getting crucified. So you don't have to be baptized in water to go to heaven. In fact, how do we get to heaven? Well, the Bible's pretty clear. There's so many passages. Ephesians chapter 2 says it this way. It says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God. So nothing you do can get you to heaven. It's a gift from God, not of works, so that no one can boast. In other words, we don't get to heaven because we did the right things. Like if we check off the boxes and we go to church enough times, finally you're going to hit the threshold and God's going to say, bing, okay, they made it, now they're in. It's not like if you give a lot in the offering. Now we're supposed to tithe and be generous, but it's not like if you give enough, then you're going to get to heaven. It's not by our works. It's not by what we do. It's through faith. So baptism could be seen as a work. Well, if I do that, so God says, listen, it's a gift. If you will put your faith in me and trust in me, you will be saved. So here's the thing. Baptism, water baptism is not required to get to heaven. But I will say this, it's strongly encouraged in Scripture. So let's talk about it for a minute. Here's the second question. You all with me? Shout amen. amen. You ready, Santa Paula? Write this down. Second question is this, so what is water baptism? I just want to clarify this because maybe from a, a different religious tradition, maybe you don't, um, haven't heard what the Bible has to say about this. So first of all, the word baptized, um, it's a 
Greek word, and here's literally what it means. It means to cover wholly with fluid. It means to dip. So the idea is that something, if it's baptized, it doesn't just sit on the water. It doesn't just get splashed with water. It is submerged in the water. So that's why you're going to see, today is Baptismal Sunday at Higher Vision Church. We have the baptismal tank. We have Pastor Dwayne uh, Pine, who is our congregational care pastor. I'm not sure if he's in this service. I think he's teaching and he's part of the class. But, oh, that's right. He's doing a baptismal class. So you're going to see him get into that tank, and then people are going to get into the water. He's going to then ask them a question, have you received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? And then what's going to happen? They're going to say, yes, I profess faith in Christ. He's going to say, okay, put your hand right here. He covers kind of their hand. And, and then what does he do? He submerses them or he immerses them in the water completely, and then they come back out. That is what we see in Scripture. In fact, if you look in the Bible, the few examples we have of baptism, one of them is Jesus. That's what happened. John the Baptist took him. He was in a river, and Jesus went into the water, and the Bible says he came out of the water. So the idea in Scripture is inferred that basically the meaning of the word and the example of Christ is that when you get baptized, you go under the water, and when you do, here's what they say. I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we read, right? Jesus said, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the, in the name of the Holy Spirit. That's basically what biblical water bapti baptism is. Now, I just want to make a point because, you see, what baptism really is, is it is a post conversion response to a decision that you've made in your life. So baptism is, is it's, it's post-conversion. In other words, you've decided to follow Jesus, so because you've decided to follow Jesus, then you get baptized. You've made the decision. In fact, that's the model we see in the New Testament. In fact, when the church was launched, the very first church experience happened on the day of Pentecost. Remember, 120 were in the upper room. They received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They've been speaking in tongues. What happens? The Bible says a crowd gathers. Peter gets up and preaches the first sermon. We know that then these people, they're convicted. I'll read the passage in a minute. They're convicted of their sin. And what happens? They call on Jesus, and then you're going to see they get baptized. And the church is launched with 3,000 new converts. Let me show you. It's found in Acts chapter 2. Peter's words pierced their hearts. He preached a sermon. They were convicted. And they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized. So first, you repent. You call on Jesus. And once you've made that con decision and commitment, then what is the next logical foundational step of faith? Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So let me explain this. So maybe you're new to church. Here's our philosophy here at Higher Vision. We believe the Bible teaches this, but it's simply this, and that is that we dedicate babies, we baptize believers. Okay? Let me say that again. We dedicate babies, we baptize believers. Now, why do we do that? If you come from a, maybe a Catholic background, I know that some of you might have, as a child, been baptized, and they splashed water on you as a child. Why do we dedicate rather than baptize children? Well, first of all, if you got baptized as a child, awesome. Good for you. High five. Come on, just everybody give each other a high five. That's fine. The more that we're in church, the more that we're involved in spiritual things that connect with Jesus, great. But the reason that we dedicate children is because Jesus was dedicated when he was eight days old. He was taken to the house of God. He was circumcised. Praise God, we don't do that in church anymore. <laughs> Amen. And then he was dedicated to God, and then later in his life, he was baptized. You see, children, as infants, um, they haven't made a decision to follow Jesus. They're innocent. They don't know any different. I mean, I, I have a grand... Did I tell you I have a grandfather? <laughs> I, have a, I have a grandson. His name is Arbor. And he really has two things on his mind right now. Sleeping and going to the bathroom. And he's really good at both, I've got to tell you. He's amazing. He's gifted. 
You see, they're innocent, and if a child dies, they're going to heaven. An infant goes to heaven before they get to the age of accountability, of knowing right and wrong, right? But once we get to the age of accountability, now we get to decide, are we going to do the right thing? Are we going to follow Jesus? Are we going to put our faith in Christ? And so that's why as children, um, we dedicate them and say, God, we want to give them to you. We want to want to get them started because the Bible says children are like arrows, right, in the hands of a warrior. And what do you do with an a, a bow and an arrow? An arrow, you, you put it in position. You give it the power it needs to accelerate forward, and you point it in the right direction. And that's what we do as parents. We bring children, and we say, we're going to set this child on course to one day follow Jesus. We're going to get them in church. We're going to teach them the things of God. And when they get to a place of accountability, they'll make that decision to follow the Lord. So we dedicate children, but we baptize believers. Why? Because baptism is a post-conversion decision. Y'all with me? Now, here's the second or the, the next question. Question number three. Write this down, and that's why should I be water baptized? If I don't need it to get to heaven, why should I do it? It's a fair question. So I'm going to give you three reasons why we should get water baptized today. Is that all right? All right, first reason. Reason number one, because water baptism demonstrates you've been cleansed. Water baptism demonstrates you've been cleansed. Let me, let me ask you a question. How many here have ever been around someone who hasn't been cleansed and they have what's called B.O.? Some of you are not sure, so you're like, keep that arm down. Come on, how many know if you're around someone that smells really bad, um, it means that they need to be cleansed. <laughs> Amen? Y'all are like really religious this morning. I don't know, you're like, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never had to be cleansed, never taken a shower. The, the body odor tells us that there's something dirty. Our body, our pores are not clean. And how many know that if you just take a rag and you just wipe a little bit, you're still going to have BO? Why? Because you need to get in the water because the water will flush away the things that need to be cleansed. Now I'm bringing this up because that's what water baptism does, it represents the cleansing, because here's what the reality. All of us have spiritual B.O. We've all been stained with sin. And I want to read to you what it says. This is an interesting passage in 1 Peter chapter 2. It says, God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat, or the ark. Only eight people were saved from drowning in this terrible flood. And that water is a picture of, of baptism, which now saves you, not by removing dirt from your body, but as a precious or as a response to God from a clean conscience. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So now here, here's the picture. Noah lived in an age when everyone was stained horrifically with evil and with sin. And at that time, there was no Jesus to save us. And it was so bad that there was no way to cleanse it. So what does God have to do in that situation? I know it's a difficult thing to understand. And if you struggle with that whole Noah's Ark thing and you have a problem with that, listen, I don't have every answer, so you can talk to God when you get to heaven about it. Is it okay? But what he did was he cleansed it through water. And he used water to cleanse the world so that it could start again and be clean. And that idea of being saved or cleansed through the water is the same image of baptism. That you and I have been stained with sin, but aren't you thankful that God loved us so much that he gave us a spiritual cleansing? And so when we go into the baptismal tank and we go under the water and we come back up, it means that the dirt that has clogged your spirit, that the stain that has clogged your life has now been removed from you and you are clean because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody shout amen. What a beautiful image. 
In fact, it's not just that you've been cleansed, but when you go water baptized, in fact, let me explain it this way. So when my girls were, were small, um, Macy, I think, was in six, fifth or sixth grade, and one day I came home, and she was really into, you know, she's learning to write and read and all that, and so she's really into crayons and markers, and so I come home, and uh, I walk around the corner, and I look, and what's crazy is there in front of the bathroom is Devette, and she's about to cry. Macy, she's about to cry, and then I look at the door, and then I start to cry, <laughs> because on this big, beautiful white door to the bathroom, my daughter Macy has decided to write a message. And here's what she wrote in black marker. Do not go in there. <laughs> How many here, when you've left the bathroom, you felt like you need to write that on there too? <laughs> Do not go in there. <laughs> and then she wrote another word that begins with a P and ends with a P. If you haven't figured it out, it's poop. So she wrote on the door in black marker, do not go in there, poop. <laughs> so we're upset, and she gets in trouble and everything, but then we're like, okay, it's over, not a big deal, and I'm thinking I'll just, you know, I'll paint over it. So I paint, white paint, I'm like, we'll be good, it dries, it's still there. <laughs> and I paint again, and it's still there, and I paint again, and it's still there, and I paint again, and it's still there, and that's... So, you know, what we ended up having to do is tried sanding it. That didn't really work. So, you know, what we had to do, we had to get a new door. <laughs> you know what I love about water baptism is, is you can, without Jesus, because of all the, because here's what the Bible says, we all have been stained by sin. You can try everything in the book to get rid of that stain. You can wipe. Right? You can try to do good things but it's only through the blood of Jesus Christ that the Bible says that when you receive Christ, old things are passed away. All things have been made new. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. You are a new door. And what happens is when you come out of that baptismal tank, you are reminding yourself, you're reminding the devil, you're letting God know, you're letting the world know, you're letting your kids know that you are stained no more. You have been cleansed because of the love and grace of Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody shout amen. So why should I get water baptized? Because it demonstrates that we've been cleansed. Let me give you the next one. Water baptism, why should we do it? Because it demonstrates you believe in Jesus. It demonstrates that you believe in Jesus. I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of things in this world that are trying to get you to believe in them. It could be a product. It could be a philosophy. It could be a mindset could be a political uh, perspective. There's a lot of things, a lot of people, a lot of issues that are trying to get your belief. And I'm going to tell you something. If you believe in certain things and you don't put your anchor, you don't set your life on the rock, Jesus Christ, you are going to float. There are going to things that are going to drift. You're going to shift back and forth. But there's one thing that will keep you solid and centered, and that is when you put your faith on Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Savior of the world. He's the rock. He's the truth. In fact, we're going to talk about that in the weeks to come. In fact, I love this because there's a story in the Bible. Remember where Paul is in prison and he was worshiping. And when he started worshiping in the middle of the night in the dungeon, his chains fell off and the doors flew open. And what happens? The, the guard who was in charge of the prison, he's freaked out because he thinks everybody's left because it's pitch black in there. They don't have electricity. He thinks everybody's left. He's going to die because of it. And then he finds out that, that Paul is still there and he runs in. And watch what it says. He falls at Paul's feet. It's found in Acts chapter 16. Guys, if you'll bring that up. And when he sees Paul, he says, Sir, what must I do to be saved? They replied, what's the next word? Believe, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. 
He brought them into his house and sent a meal before them. Check this out now. It says, and he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. When you get baptized, you know what it says? It says, I believe in Jesus. I'm going to go old school. How many of you grew up in church and remember this old school song? I remember I used to go to camps, and I would do these youth camps, and I had my guitar, and, and I would sing this song. I believe in Jesus. Anybody remember this song? I believe he is the son of God. Sometimes I bring my electric guitar. Electric guitar. I believe. I, I, I know the song. And it talks about believing in Jesus. Here's another old school. And you guys remember this one? This is real old school. Hey, I'm a believer now since Jesus changed my life. Anybody remember that one? I mean, you're like, I have no idea what this guy is talking about. I love those songs about believing in Jesus. You know, in fact, it might be next week, but in the, in the next week or two, we're going to sing songs about believing in Jesus. Listen, there's noth nothing greater to put your trust in. There's nothing greater to put your faith in. When you go into that baptismal tank and you come out of the water, you know what you're saying? I believe in Jesus. I've been cleansed. Here's the other thing that's powerful. Why do, why do we get baptized? Because water baptism demonstrates your identification some of you are like what does that mean well it's pretty awesome because look what the scripture says in Colossians Colossians chapter 2 tells us for you were buried what's the next word with Christ when you were baptized so you're identifying with Christ you're participating with Christ so you were buried with Christ when you're baptized and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of of God who raised Christ from the dead. So when you go into the baptismal tank and you go under the water and you come back out, what you're doing is you're identifying with Jesus who died, but then he rose again. I got to tell you, we live in a world right now, and I, I, my heart goes out especially to this next generation. This next generation is struggling to figure out who in the world they are. They're struggling with all of these issues the gender confusion, sexual confusion, all of these things. It's, a, it's amazing how people are trying to figure out who they are. In fact, a conversation with my youngest son oh, this last week, we, we were talking with him and we were talking about his story and where God has brought him. And he, he said this to us and he's never said it before and I've always known it was an issue. But he said, you know, Dad, one of the issues of why I was doing all that I was doing is because I, I just didn't know who I was. Our youngest is adopted, and so I didn't know who my birth mother was. And, I, and I, I, I was just trying to figure out who I am. Can I tell you something? You don't have to live through the rest of your life trying to figure out who you are. God created you with a purpose and a design, and he has a plan for your life. Can I show you something that's awesome, that's connected to water baptism? Check this out. This is Jesus. Jesus shows up to get baptized. He sees John the Baptist. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to detour him, saying, Hey, Jesus, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Can I just pause that real quick? Can I tell you that when it comes to water baptism, I really believe this. There's always a voice of the enemy that will try to stop you from doing something God is leading you to do. Something that's good for your spirit. The devil will always work overtime. Now, I'm not saying John the Baptist was the devil, but I'm telling you, there's always that spirit that will try to stop. So he says, no, no, Jesus, you don't need to be baptized. I should be baptizing you. But Jesus replies, no, let it be so now. We're going to do this thing. It is proper. It's a good thing to do. It's the right thing to do, getting water baptized. It's proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized... And the Bible says he went up out of the water, so that's the reference to immersion. So he went into the water, and this Bible says when he came out of the water, at that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, alighting on him. And what does it say? And a voice from heaven said, this is my Son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. You realize that baptism was a moment that God used to pour his spirit upon Jesus. So let's just make it general. 
when you get water baptized, it's a moment where the Holy Spirit can come upon you to help you recognize your identification, that you are a son or a daughter of the living God. You are a part of the family of God. And that means that God loves you. That means that God has a plan for you. That means that God has a purpose for your life. When you get water baptized, it's a way that the Holy Spirit helps you to figure out this is who I am. I belong to the king, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. I love that. You know, let me, let me just kind of explain it this way. I have on my finger a ring. Now, I don't wear this ring because I want to bling, you know. If I wanted to bling out, I'd get a, you know, like a chain with a gold coin and maybe some earrings and some of you are like, where's he going with this? Okay, well, let's just get back. I don't know where I'm going with that. I, I, I'm wearing a ring, and here's why I'm wearing a ring. Because it, Beck, can I tell you, I've worn it now for 30 years. 30 years. I can tell you, being with Tibet, it's flown by, like four minutes, underwater. But, but um, <laughs> no, I'm teasing, I'm teasing flown by but here's the thing wearing this ring doesn't make me married it just tells you that I am wearing the ring doesn't make me married it just what it does is it tells the world that I am married it, it identifies me in a relationship that I've got my best friend my soulmate my God helper, my spouse, my partner in crime, Tibet. It doesn't make me married. It identifies me with who I'm married to. Water baptism doesn't make you saved. It just lets everybody know you are. And it identifies you with the relationship that matters most. That is your God who created you, who has a plan and a purpose for your life. So when I think about this, Santa Paula, when I think about it, all over Southern California, here's the, the next question then. Here's the last question. We're going to bring this to a close. You ready? What it, anyone know what it is? It's this. So when should I be baptized? If it's important, then I should do it. And it's a moment to, to have the Holy Spirit spotlight me, reform my understanding of who I am. And when should I do it? Well, there's a verse. We're going to skip to that last verse again, guys, on the team back there. I love it because Paul, remember Paul had this encounter with God. He was going to, to kill and to persecute and arrest Christians. Jesus shows up. He has this encounter with Jesus. Jesus sends him to Damascus, and he, he basically begins to believe in Jesus, but he's blind. So the Holy Spirit sends Ananias to his house, and he prays for him, and the, the scales fall off. He has this encounter with Jesus, and then watch what Ananias says. He says this, Paul, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. And you know, that, that's my question today waiting for? What, what's the excuse? What's the John the Baptist excuse the enemy's been using? Well, pastor, I don't know. Because here's, here's what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to take this moment and we're going to have a spontaneous baptismal service right now. Now, we have people that are in a class and they're going to come and do a next service as well. But the last two services, we've had tons of people just started realizing what God had done for them. And they're like, you know what? I want to get baptized. There are people here that have never been baptized. So, so what's your excuse? Well, you know, Pastor, I didn't bring a shirt, an extra shirt. Guess what? We have extra shirts. We bought some. Well, I don't have a towel, Pastor Jerry. Guess what? We went and bought towels this week. <laughs> well, wait a minute. I'm a planner. You know, I'm always planning ahead. And I didn't plan for this. What, what is the thing that's holding you back? 
Because maybe today, maybe the Holy Spirit, what you're feeling, that little flutter in your heart, in your gut, that butterfly, that's the Holy Spirit. Maybe he's saying, you know what? It's time for you to put on your ring. Maybe you just kind of gotten hard. And your spirit's just been so dry. And, and maybe today you just need to say, you know what? I, I know I was baptized 20 years ago, but you know what? It's time for me to just say, you know what, God, I want to make a declaration again. I want to start fresh. I want a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. I want the world to know that I believe in you. So today, we're literally, in just a moment, I'm going to pray a prayer. I'm going to release you to come, and, and we're going to let you get baptized. Maybe you're here, and you were christened as a child, but you hadn't made a decision. And today, you're like, I want the world to know that I have decided. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. In order to do that, though, in order to get baptized, what you need to do is you need to make a decision to follow Jesus. You had to invite him into your life.